we learn that none of us are ever as alone as we think we are. And none of us are ever as broken as we think we are. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Women Worldwide. Thank you so much for tuning in and for being here. We appreciate you and all the sharing that you're doing, the sharing of the shows and the stories of our amazing guests, and also sharing how you're doing and feeling, because we love to hear from you. Well, it's another week, and we have an interesting story, and of course, an, a guest who has a lot of insight and advice for you. So let's get right to today's topic and special guest. The topic is strength, passion, and the personal story. Have you embraced yours? And what would inspire you to share? Well, that is the best segue to my guest today. Joining me on the show is Stephanie Raffalock. And Stephanie is the author of a book called... Create it, create tricks. I got that right, Stephanie. <laughs> create tricks rising. It's unlocking the power of midlife women. Now, this is not her first book. Stephanie also has an award winning book, and I like the title of this one. It's a delightful little book on aging, and shouldn't everything about aging be <laughs> delightful? Stephanie is a former iHeartRadio host. She's also a speaker giving presentations to many different groups, and she does personal development classes. She teaches these classes for incarcerated women and also for nonprofits, including Dress for Success in Austin. Stephanie, it's great to have you on my show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'll tell you, I really love the title of your book now that I can get it right. Yeah. <laughs> Create Tricks rising. So before we dive into your book, maybe you can just share a little bit about your journey. And did you always know that you wanted to be an author? Well, I should have known, but I, I think I was slow to come to it. I do remember the first thing that I ever wrote. And now that I look back, I can tell you why I wrote it. And I was five years old. My parents were going through a divorce and I drew a cartoon and in the cartoon, the woman was carrying a bag with a man in it. And my mom said to me, what is that? And I said, this is the wife and she's allergic to her husband. <laughs> and so that was the story. And what story has always done for me is it helps me make sense of the world by getting out the feelings and the thoughts and the tone of the inner life and then reconciling them with the outer world. So Yes, I should have known, but I came to writing a little later in life. And it's like the cactus flower. It's, you know, there's always got to be a late bloomer, right? Well, as, as long as the flower blooms, that's the most important thing. Well, right. it's really interesting, this inner life, the outer life. Talk to us about Creatrix Rising and maybe what is it that you wanted readers to know about this book? Share, share the big takeaways. Well, Creatrix Rising was written in response to the way I see women in our world right now, today. I think that we're in an evolutionary kind of moment, a Darwinian moment, if you will, that women have never had the advantage of the level playing field. And suddenly there were three things that happened in a very short period of time. And there was this huge shift. The first thing that happened was the Women's March of 2017. Whether you participated in that or not, it was a bit of feminist history that united women everywhere. The second thing that happened was um, that, that more women over the age of 50 ran for political office in 2018 midterms than ever before in our history. And the third thing that happened was hashtag me too. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was so important about hashtag me too was women stopped carrying that dirty little secret. In my generation, if a woman was harassed or um, abused in that way, that was something you whispered about in the ladies room. And very often from another woman, you might get a response like, well, you know, boys will be boys. 
So eliminating that hashtag me too was um, liberating for generations of women, not just women today. So those three things changed the consciousness and the direction of women. And I started seeing that and I went, where's the name for this? Where's the archetype for this? Because men have long had names like wizard and sage, and that's how we mark their midlife and older years. Where is that for women? So I talked with a Jungian friend of mine and I said, is it like terribly bold and arrogant of me to say, I have a sense of the emerging archetype. And he said, no, not at all, because, you know, everything is fluid, even in Jungian terms. So creatrix is one of the three weavers, one of the, or, or one of the three Greek fates. Remember, there was the spinner, there was the weaver, and there, there was the cutter. The weaver, creatrix, is a woman who makes things. That's what the word means. Now, the paradigm up till then was Robert Graves' paradigm of the maiden, the mother, and the crone. Well, I don't know any young woman that relates to being a maiden. It, you know, connotes <laughs> virgins running barefoot in the forest, you know, with the sprites. Um, motherhood is certainly a definition that has gone from the Madonna um, purity, you know, the mother is everything. And the reality of that is mothers are, are courageous figures that are more likely to have skin, knees and baby barf on their shoulder. <laughs> and then the word crone, I just think that we need to eliminate entirely because crone is a word that entered the lexicon sometime in the 1300s. And it means disagreeable old woman. And I don't know any older woman that wants that title. Right. So, and it was meant as an insult and some would, Words should just not be reclaimed and they should be banished. So creatrix replaces the word chrome. That is really interesting. Thank you for sharing yeah. sort of how you came up with the name and just the thought process behind it. When you mentioned the three events that really had you thinking, do you think that it was the energy and the momentum that led to each one? but that also made it easier for younger generations as well. So I know that a lot of older generations were sharing these stories. Where do you think the younger generation, millennials and, and even now Gen Z, where do they fall into this? I think that they're still thoughtfully dealing with those issues. And, and when I look at the changes that have happened for women just in my lifetime, I, I suspect that great changes like that will also happen in a young woman's lifetime. Um, I recently did a presentation at Southern Oregon University, these of these Zoom, mm -hmm. um, in which I had a panel of young women, four young women that were college students there. And I was surprised to know that they all had a little energy on the whole hashtag me too thing, that women could still be harassed, that women could still be seen as, you know, not quite as equal as. Um, it took me aback, but I do think that that generation is more equipped to deal with it than my generation was. I think they're a little more prepared to deal with that. You know, we are, we are in a post Harvey Weinstein world. We are in mm -hmm. a post hashtag me too world. That doesn't mean that it's all cleaned up though. It still means that we have, we have work to do. I agree. I think there's a lot of work to do when it comes to women and kind of unlocking this power, where do they even begin? So I mentioned in the introduction, the strength and the passion and the personal story, but you know, they say everybody has a story in them. How do you actually draw that out and get inspired to share? That's a great question. Um, women especially need to tell their story. Men have been telling their stories for a long time. Women free themselves when ha somehow when they tell their story. Where to begin? I would say begin with your family. Recall the oldest story in your matriarchy that you can find. So that might be a story about a great grandmother who um, was an immigrant here. It might be a story about a grandmother, a beloved grandmother. Know that those stories of the women who came before you, um, those women paid, paved a way 
and they paid a price. And so that's a good place to begin. And then it takes the pressure off of you. Well, what, what story could I possibly have? But honestly, I think our most important and most valuable stories are the most common stories. It's what connects us as women, it's what connects us as human beings. It doesn't have to be some big event. We all can't be Madame Curie. You know, we're not gonna discover penicillin, but we all have a story about where we saw an unfairness or an injustice in the world that affected women, that affected our mothers or our grandmothers or affected us. And those are the stories that we deserve to share. Um, I think that in sharing those stories, that then feeds the strength because we learn that none of us are ever as alone as we think we are. And none of us are ever as broken as we think we are. That's right. the power of the story. No, that's true. Do you think it's that feeling of being alone that stops a woman from sharing either her personal story or that of her grandmother or her great grandmother? Why would somebody choose? Because this is all about choice. Why would somebody choose not to share when there's so much benefit and it's so freeing and you're helping others with a story? Well, I, I think that we can look at thousands of years of archetypal conditioning to begin with that, you know, there was a time not that long ago when, well, when women like children should be seen and not heard. You know, we still in, in our generations are concerned with physical appearance above and beyond those things that nourish the soul. So um, I think that's one of the main reasons that advertising plays a big role. And sometimes you just aren't around the people that encourage you to tell a story. I mean, where do women have an opportunity to share a story? It's like, we all live life like this, you know? <laughs> and so where is the story in that? One of the things that I love about podcasting and the popularity of podcasting is that it returns story to its original oral tradition which makes it very special, a time when people used to gather around a campfire and, and listen to the stories of, of their elders or their ancestors. Absolutely. So do you think that, let's talk about sharing the story. Let's say that some of the Women Worldwide audience gets inspired and they have the strength and the passion and they want to share. Is it to go on a podcast or just get out there on social media to share or maybe tell your best friend on a Zoom or how should we be sharing today? Well, maybe you have two or three friends that would be interested in sharing a story. There's an organization here in Austin called Story Circle Network. And it's a national organization, storycirclenetwork.org. And Story Circle Network has these um, storytelling groups um, that unfortunately have not been happening since the pandemic, but right. um, but there are places, safe space where you come to share your story, not to be critiqued, not to try to be fixed, not for any other reason than just to to give that story wings, to give that story air, because we all know when you air something out, it's like you, then it can breathe again. Exactly. Again. So I would start with small groups of people. Can you start with a friend or two friends and say? Are you interested in a storytelling group? You know, preserving the oral tradition and telling the story of what it's like to be a woman. What did it take to become a woman? What's it like maturing as a woman? What's it like to grow old as a woman? That is, that is really interesting. And I think you're right about the storytelling group. There's something about social media that can be really intimidating. And it's almost, if you want to share, you don't know where to start, it's that hesitancy because if I put it out there, the opinions that I might get, and, and people are really vocal and they will passionately tell you how they feel <laughs> about your story. So it, it is a good idea in that it's kind of a safe space, what you mentioned with the this type of group. Right. And, and I think that there's a greater connection when we're sharing something vulnerable, and of course, authenticity is born of vulnerability. When you Absolutely. have a person that you can just be close with, someone, a friend that you trust, like I trust my girlfriends. They're not after me. They're not looking to just make their opinion heard. And they can kind of sit back and just, oh, listen. So I, I think that, yeah, social media, like you say, um, it, 
it gets a little daunting, you know, social media runs the gambit from harsh rhetoric to rainbows and unicorns. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's difficult to right. where you fit in that <laughs> scheme of things. Exactly. That's a great point. So tell us, maybe you could share an, an aha moment that you had that was at some point in your journey, your career that really stuck with you, a, a learning moment. Well, I'm going to give you two aha moments. The first one is um, for my personal life. The, the personal life aha moment was, wow, everybody suffers. And you don't have to scratch the surface too deep to know that everybody knows what pain is. Mm-hmm. And that somehow made me relax in the world, that I wasn't wrong or I wasn't, you know, not doing it right because I, because I had pain in my life that pain is a part of life. It's part of what textures the heart. You can't know compassion without having some pain in your life. Right. The other aha moment I have is just the aha moment I had as as a writer, as an artist. And that is that all art has form. And what that means to me is you can't, well, I guess you can. You can just pick up a guitar and say, I'm going to play the guitar, but you're only going to get so far. But Mm -hmm. if you study the form, you can learn to become a guitarist. And the same is true of writing. You can write your heart out, Mm -hmm. but until you learn form and structure and you study the form, um, mostly what you've got is rambling narrative. I I know this (laughs) from which I speak. (laughs) I know what rambling narrative is. It's mastery. Basically, you're talking about mastering your your craft. Yeah, and I don't know that anyone ever masters their craft. Probably not. But you can study the form. So if you're interested in writing memoir, then study memoir. If you're interested in writing poetry, then study poetry. If you're interested in doing podcasting, then study podcasting. (laughs) That's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing those moments. With everything that you have going on, because you have your books, you're speaking, you're teaching classes. What keeps you focused and motivated when we're all on Zoom and we have these smartphones next to us within three feet of our bodies usually? Oh, I'm so over Zoom. <laughs> I'm so over Zoom. Um, what keeps me motivated is where we started out this conversation. Writing for me has, has always been a doorway into the examined life. And I put great value on the examined life. It helps me to reconcile my inner world and my outer world. And I love the process of find of my heart finding expression in the world. So that's what keeps me going. That's what brings me to my desk every morning to sit down and bang away at the keyboard. When inner world meets outer world, is that your sense of peace? Kind of joy, <laughs> sometimes joy, happiness. Sometimes it's a sense of great chaos <laughs> when the inner world and the outer world meet. I, I don't think that you know I'm going. Is for there ever it. a blending, a calming <laughs> of the world? <laughs> I, I'm not really going for the Zen moment as much as I'm going for the authentic moment, the true moment. You know, I love that. where the where the pain is, where the joy is. Can you hold um, the sorrow of life right next to the joy of life? But it's mm-hmm. contrast. You you cannot experience joy if you don't understand <laughs> sorrow. If we never had sorrow, we wouldn't have joy. Just like you said about the pain and the passion. If you don't have fear, you wouldn't experience love, which is on the opposite end of the spectrum. Right. It's the contrast that yes. really textures us it's just you don't want to get stuck in the the, no, pain and the sorrow it's to say i realize what this is and i understand it now i need to move and use it. it and use it because in the pain yes. and the sorrow is always wisdom there's mm-hmm. always what wisdom. did you learn exactly like, you know it's like something is asking to be felt mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so And I think that's where you get the strength and passion (laughs) to be able to tell that personal story. And embrace it. 
and embrace it. Wow, we just came full <laughs> circle. Full circle, didn't we? I love that. <laughs> I love it. So what do you do? Okay, so you said you're not out for the Zen, but at times you do have to calm yourself and I'm sure you have stressful days. Maybe a couple of tips on how do you de-stress? Um, I like to sit on my back porch early in the morning and just listen and watch as the world comes alive around me. That's one of my great de-stressor things. Um, I love to swim. So this time of year, I swim as much as I can. And there's something about the sensuality of the water and the sun on my back that just, it just speaks to something in me. It, it downshifts everything. And I love to walk. I love to walk in the woods. Now this time of year, I don't walk in the woods so much because here in Texas, of course, we have snakes. <laughs> and I don't, I'm not crazy about snakes, you know, nothing personal, but just not crazy about them. But during the fall months and the winter months, I do walk in the woods. And it's funny that the Texas woods are different than the woods anywhere that I've lived in, in Colorado or Oregon, um, but they still are the woods. And I have this belief that the trees hold our stories for us until we're ready to tell them. That's awesome. That is beautiful. Well, I definitely can relate to the swimming. <laughs> you said I, I don't have a I have a deck to sit on, which I love to hear the morning sounds. But the swimming, there's something about that and the walking. I don't have any woods around me, but certainly I could see why that would be so calming and appealing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I can't even believe I'm going to ask you for parting advice. So <laughs> tell us, advice. tell us, Stephanie, what um, can women do so that they can really embrace that strength and passion and share their stories? Get them out there. Well, give yourself a stamp of approval. Your stamp of approval, not someone else's. And know that your story matters that you matter and that everyone in our world wants to be seen and heard and know that they matter. So join in the process. Oh, that's beautiful. I think that's really great advice. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. And please tell us where can everybody find you and your books and your work? Well, my books are available on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any place that you're getting your books online. I still don't know about bookstores because I don't know what's open and what's not, but it's not that hard to find. Um, if your show airs before August 24th, my new book, Creatrix Rising, comes out on August 24th, but it is available for pre-order now on Amazon. And I'd like to give a shout out to um, bookshop.org because when you buy books from them, they contribute to local bookstores. Not the oh, big that's so good. But local bookstores, so yeah. And you can find me at byline-stephanie.com. Um, Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It was really interesting to chat with you. Appreciate your time and all of your advice. This was fun. It went really fast. And thank you so much. It was fun. That, that's why it went so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> because we had a good time. We didn't have to do this. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So thank you. And thank you to all of you for tuning in to Women Worldwide. Please keep the conversations going and the feedback coming. You know where you can find me. I'm on Twitter at Deep Breckenridge. And you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. Okay, friends. Until our next episode, stay focused, energized, and feeling empowered. Thank you.